with Steve Cassano. It's January. Hang on there. With Steve Cassano, it's June 22nd, 2010. We're doing a series of interviews. These are all going to be, um, how should I say, preserved in the archives for posterity. But what we're going to do is also take excerpts out so that um, we'll probably produce a video that can be shown. We'll probably have stuff on the college's website. So, Steve, when did you first come to Manchester Community College? Uh, January of 1966. Uh, I enrolled uh, full-time as a student at the time. Uh, not sure about the community college system, not sure about the future, uh, but it was a real opportunity for me. Uh, I'd gone to college before that, uh, was in school, my mother died. It was one of those things that with family needs, I went home. Uh, I moved to Connecticut, and uh, I was working here, and I figured I'd, uh, I would enroll in the college and see what it was. What was it like to be a student in the mid to late 60s? Oh, we used to call it work as you because uh, you know, everybody worked full time. Uh, I had, uh, because I had responsibilities, family responsibilities with my brothers and everything, with the loss of my parents, I used to work, uh, I worked two full time jobs. I worked midnight to 7 for Pratt and Whitney, I worked 8 to 4.30 for uh, the A&P, and then I went to school full time at night. But a lot of us did that. It was the beginning of the uh, Vietnam t turmoil, uh, it was the uh, the wild 60s, uh, and uh, we all found time to enjoy going to school. For a lot of us, uh, we use the term second chance you as well, that uh, many of us had been to other schools and uh, for a variety of reasons, uh, left school or whatever it might be, and so this was an opportunity to uh, to get back into academics, and uh, so it was, it was a, just a great thing at the time. Do you remember any of your teachers from uh, that? Oh, day? sure, sure. Uh, uh, there are a couple that had particular influences on me. Uh, I remember when I tried to register for my courses, I made sure that everything I took was transferable. And in the uh, two years that I was here, I ended up with 66 credits, all transfer. And I was uh, still a Massachusetts resident. But there were some courses, you know, I took that I didn't want to take, uh, but I had to take, obviously, de degree requirements. We all go through that. I was really uh, intimidated by taking a music course. Uh, Bob Vader was uh, probably one of the greatest influences on me at the time. Uh, same with having to take a lab course. I had never uh, done well in the labs, and I had to take Bob Dobson for a lab course. And uh, uh, it was just, uh, he made it so interesting and so on that uh, and, you know, I worked hard in those courses. Uh, uh, and Jim Tatro was the third. Uh, I did more reading and writing and map word, uh, work with uh, Jim Tatro than I probably did my entire life in those two semesters. But uh, when I transferred to a four-year school, I had worked so hard here uh, with good professors that I found it easier at the junior uh, and senior level. In fact, I did my junior senior in one year. Uh, I could never have done that here. When you were a student here, did you ever imagine that you would actually be colleagues with some of your teachers? Uh, I had always dreamed about it. Uh, I was very active as a student. I mean, this was a, it's a different place now than it was in the 1960s. We had four fraternities. We had three sororities. We had about 15 clubs and organizations. I was president of the Student Senate, uh, 67 to 68, and we put in requirements as an example that every organization would get, f would get a stipend, but they had to do community service. And so I remember we were still the new kid in town as a community college, so we had to show that we belonged. These people were coming from all over the region, and so uh, they went to MCC. Uh, uh, they joined, uh, I don't care if it was the chess club or, or whatever, but a whole variety of different op uh, organizations all doing things in the community. And uh, in the winter time, I think we had four houses up at Bolton Lake that we rented, uh, different fraternities and sororities. Uh, we used to have uh, great weekend events up there. I uh, used to go across the ice uh, from place to place, and uh, and uh, we just found time to do it. There was a camaraderie among us because we were a growing school. We were all working. Uh, we, Many of us, again, had uh, been to schools and so on, uh, and it was just, it was that 60s fever, I think, that we all had at the same time. I mean, we all had our hair down to here. Uh, the Beatles were real hot. I mean, it was, uh, it was just a great time to go to school. Do you think you got a good education, good preparation for your bachelor's degree? Absolutely. Uh, I transferred and uh, graduated in 68, uh, and I actually did my, uh, I went to Boston, uh, Boston State, and I was able to take the subway down to uh, BU for an anthropology course and took 21 hours in the summer. I did my junior, senior year in one year. 
Um, and then I got my master's in one year, and that was the ironic part. I said to Dr. Lowe uh, when I graduated, you know, someday I want to come back. Uh, I had a very good working relationship with him as a president of the college, as a student, because I was president of the student senate. He wanted the student senate involved, insisted he had an open door, which he did. When they planned the lower campus, which we just finally tore down last year, uh, he made sure that I was in on all of those meetings so that students had a say, and I was representing students at those meetings. And I told him, someday I want to come back. And it was sure, you know, it was one of those, yeah, sure, kid, you know, see you sometime. And uh, a year later, I had my bachelor's, and I said, I'm starting my master's in August, and uh, hope I'm back next year. And he saved me a slot. And thank goodness he did, because uh, Meskel became the new governor, and he had a freeze on, and I was hired before the freeze. So uh, I started here in 1970, and my first class, I had 16 students that I knew uh, as students when I was here in 68. <laughs> When you were hired, was there a search process, or was it just yes. mostly? At that time, it was a, they were looking for sociologists. Uh, I had no teaching experience, but Fred Lowe was one of those with vision that said, look, here's a guy, he's the first one to get a master's degree. He's able to transfer his credits. Here's an example for you as students. And so uh, I was just in the right place at the right time. So he gave me the opportunity, and I capitalized on it. Was it... Um Awkward at all being colleagues with people who were your teachers three years, four years earlier? Uh, that wasn't awkward at all. They were very, very good. What was awkward is having so many friends who I went to school with and I partied with and all those other kinds of things. All of a sudden, I'm in the front of the room instead of uh, part of the room. And uh, so that was the difficulty. And, uh, you know, I told them, you know, we are not fraternity brothers anymore. We're not members of student senator anymore. I mean, that was the toughest transaction. Uh, and ironically, uh, you know, I, uh, my daughter was born the day before I started uh, my, my, you know, my classes here. So, I mean, my life just changed so dramatically in the two-year period there from the time I left here. I got married and uh, uh, had Michelle and my first one at the same time. Uh, so it was uh, just a lot happening. What was it like to be a faculty member in the 70s and in the 80s and in the 90s? Well, the leadership from the president, I think, made a difference for all of us. His goal was very simple, uh, community number one, uh, do things differently, don't be afraid to try things differently. Uh, one of the first things he did with me is he gave me, uh, he asked me to develop an alumni association. And so instead of teaching four courses, I was teaching three in the beginning because he wanted to develop a bond with those that had graduated. And one of the difficulties he had is that a lot of us came to MCC but many, even if they transferred to other schools, didn't complete graduation requirements. They were eligible, but they just didn't do it. And uh, you know, so we've always had uh, we've had that difficulty since uh, 1970, and that thousands have come here, and a lower percentage have graduated, uh, or they have completed the enough uh, requirements, but they haven't gone through the simple process of the graduation. And so, that was one of the big things in the beginning is to try and keep uh, get people locked in to to identify and. Uh, uh, today, my kids have come here. You know, students around the you know uh, around the region will tell you that you know, I've gone on. I went to UConn. I've got I went to Easton. I've transferred. I've got a master's. Without MCC, I couldn't have done any of it. The best experience was MCC. I mean, that's the constant that I've always heard. And a lot of that was uh, you, know, you know just just being in the old building down here on Hartford Road. And then of course we had the new campus, uh, the lower campus, which was. Uh, not the greatest thing in the world, but it was new to us. Faculty East was uh, where most of our faculty were. Uh, you know, you were through it. You might be through with your classes at 2 o'clock, but you were there till 4 or 4.30. We are always talking. We are always thinking about ways we could do things differently, how we could work with each other, how we could help each other in courses. Uh, it was just a very unique situation, which I don't think exists today because of the tower, because of how we're distributed. Uh, we just don't have that physical closeness that allowed us to have this, the social closeness that we had and so on at that particular time. Who are some of the um, administrators or faculty members who you remember as being really influential and important during that period? Well, obviously Dr. Lowe was the most important. Uh, Harry Gody was a dean that was also very, very visible at the time. Uh, uh, I mentioned different people in the arts and sciences, I think, that had a great impact. John Sutherland, because of his impact on local history, I think, was uh, had a great impact. Uh, 
We were bringing people in to develop programs, uh, you know, the secretarial program, Leslie uh, DeBaldo, now Leslie Brown, uh, uh, was, was instrumental there. One of my former students was brought in uh, in the late 80s or early 80s, I guess, uh, Meg, to uh, develop uh, the respiratory pro uh, therapy program. These are many of them students who had been here. What was also interesting is that professors were coming, full-time professors were leaving Trinity or UConn or others because they wanted to teach. They were in four-year institutions where they had to publish or perish, do research, write books, and so on. They wanted to be in the classroom, and they gave up the university status to come here to teach, and they loved the classroom. And so, I mean, uh, Bill Remick was an example of that. Remick was uh, an economics teacher that just made economics easy to understand for people. Uh, John Jacobs, uh, philosophy, a tough course. Uh, uh, they, they just, uh, you know, they had uh, been in outstanding academic positions before, but lost that ability, or, you know, the contact with students because of the design of the four-year university system. So that was a boom for us as many new people came in. Are there any um, students who really stand out over the decades you were here, students who either made an impression on you while they were here or went on to accomplish significant things? Well, there were many because I developed the internship program and the uh, uh, student placement program. So I had many, many students uh, that uh, I placed some semesters, almost 200 students in a variety of different internships. Uh, you know, I had particular uh, exposure to the law enforcement program because I had a lot of law enforcement students. At one time, uh, when I was mayor of Manchester, I had 17 former students who were part of Manchester Police Department. I have nothing to do with the hiring or anything else, but when it came to internships, uh, a lot of those, uh, you know, I saw the cream of the crop uh, as they were coming through my classes, and when they were looking for internships, I had them internship, uh, do their internships in Manchester. Uh, and there was an important part of that, because uh, when you're going through oral uh, interviews, which is really big in police departments, uh, you have to understand the philosophy of the department, how it works, and so on. And by spending a semester or two semesters, they knew how the department functioned and what it was thinking and, and so on. And so it just it helped them. Uh, I have students that are chiefs and captains uh, throughout the region and so on because of the internship program. But it was the same in the medical field, secretarial field, uh, human, human resources. Uh, uh, students would come from all the different academic uh, areas to try to get into these placements. So they go out... Uh, and you know we had a philosophy. If you're going to get a job, go out and find out what it's about before you, uh, before you get there. Uh, we used to do we used to did, uh, do mock interviews all the time. If you really wanted a job at, at Travelers, we'd say go to Aetna first. Go through the process of the interview. Get used to it. You might like Aetna, but if not, at least you have a, a leg up and you're going to be ready for the Travelers interview. I mean, we did a whole variety of that, and so there were just uh, you know too many. And Nancy Kelly obviously stood out as a. Uh, went on to Harvard, Harvard from here, but uh, with the Alumni Association, I saw what our students were doing. Our students were, number one, uh, uh, led their class like Nancy did at Harvard, and they did the same thing at Yale and at Trinity, at Williams, at UConn, and so on. Uh, uh, we just had, particularly with our returning students, remember our average age was, uh, in the first few years, we were probably about 31, I think, was the average age. So we had bright people who had never had a real academic opportunity coming to the college and grasping it and, and enjoying it. Women coming to school for the first times in their lives who had been home, raised kids and so on, and came here and, uh, again, looking for opportunity uh, and looking for something different. Uh, my concern was some of these people that were so dedicated, so afraid of getting less than an A uh, because their definition of failure, the level was too high, the bar was too high. And, uh, you know, my goal was always to try to get them to enjoy being here as well as being an A student. You've always been an advocate of uh, community service and getting students out to the community. Why do you think that's so important? Well, first we're housed here. Uh, I remember Dick Fazard did a study uh, one year on the economic impact of Manchester Community College on, impact, on, on uh, Manchester itself. And when you take the number of faculty who live here, the students who come in here, buy gas, get a sandwich, and so on, it was in the millions. Uh, you know, we're putting millions into this community, but we're still driving through it every day. You know, many of us are, are renting homes here or buying homes here and so on. Uh, I've always been one of those that just feels that you need to be a part of the community. And so, you know, what better opportunity? And uh, students loved it. You know, most students wouldn't know how to go about that. That was the beauty of the Voluntary Action Program. We would go around to different classes. We would run seminars and everything else. And... Uh, you know, people say, gee, I'd like to try that. And uh, we did a survey one year on, on the interns. Uh, 
uh, fascinating, actually. We're supposed to do 100, we got 99, so we took another one randomly to get an even 100. And the beauty of it, it was all on these placements, and about, I remember the numbers, 55 of the 100 said that, you know, I'm glad I did this, it's helped me build my resume, I know this is what I wanted to do. Uh, but the number that really got me, 19 out of that 100 said, thank God I did this, because I could never do this the rest of my life. And it made a difference in changing academic direction. We register for courses, we think we're going to be this, but we have no idea what it is. Well, as an example, a lot of students felt that they wanted to work with those that had issues, uh, mental retardation issues, what we used the term at the time, and they went to Mansfield Training School. Couldn't handle it. Couldn't work with the elderly. Thought they wanted to be teachers. Couldn't work with young children. Uh, you know, there's it, it, there's a knack that you need to work one-on-one uh, -on -one and work with people with either disabilities or, or uh, hyperactive kids or whatever it might be. And uh, uh, they found out firsthand, uh, 19 at least, found out that, you know, boy, thank goodness, uh, I would if I'd have got a bachelor's and done this, what would I do? So uh, it was uh, it was as much uh, a help to them as it was a benefit to the community, uh, but a great learning experience. You've been connected to this college, well, pushing uh, 45 years or so, would that be yeah, about right? Sure. In the 60s, yep. 2000? Yep. How have you seen it evolve during that period? Uh, well, obviously, it's much bigger than we ever imagined it was going to be. Um, we've seen the discussions over the years whether it should become a four-year college and this and so on. I think that would be destructive, uh, in, uh, in personal opinion. Uh, I, I, I've always said that there are two great things America has done in education. One was require all children to go to school, which you can go back to the 40s and the 50s. Immigrant children went to school for the first time, had a real opportunity that parents never had. Well, all kids couldn't go to college either. The community college gave everybody a chance to go to school. And uh, I wouldn't change it for the world because uh, as you see the returning students, as you see 90-year-old graduates, uh, as you see kids in the high school taking courses, advanced courses to get ready to go on to college and so on, uh, different programs that we've established now that we never had before, extension-type programs, so that if you're an employer and you have a new technology or something like that. We can provide the training. We can provide job training and so on. We are in every sense a community college. And, uh, and what we give back to the community as a college is priceless. And the opportunity is priceless. So I wouldn't change it for the world. Uh, it's not the same closeness that we had in the 60s. We were smaller than, uh, of course, the 60s. Nobody will duplicate the year of the 60s anyways. Uh, that was just a, a fun time to be alive and uh, to have fun. Uh, but, you know, the, the college is bigger. Uh, it's less personal, I think. Uh, we, uh, you walk around and you, you don't know if somebody told me just at a meeting last week that says, I, they stopped for a have a cup of coffee and they, Saw this fellow there sitting there and uh, just assumed it was a student. He's a faculty member. Uh, as he carried on the car, he says, oh, my goodness, you're a faculty member. Uh, that's part of the bigness that we have in the impersonal uh, uh, situation that maybe we have that uh, we didn't have before. But that, that impersonal relationship doesn't carry on with the students. We still have that strong bond because uh, we still max out at 50 in a classroom. There are much smaller classrooms than that. <clears throat> and so students know who you are. You're there. There's no substitutes for you, basically. Uh, there's no grad students teaching you courses. You're there every day. And I think that's the, 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 biggest, uh, the biggest factor that is going to steer our future. When did you first get involved in politics? When I was here, I, after I moved here in 1970, I was on the Human Relations Committee and Commission, uh, like 1971 to 72. And uh, we were just moving into the lower campus at that time. Uh, it was the first uh, handicap accessible buildings in the region. And so I started this program, the Organization for the Handicapped, so we could start to uh, develop uh, some communication so people would know. We ended up with 200 people by 1973 who were in wheelchairs and, and, and had all kinds of various disabilities but could go to school for the first time because they could get here. And uh, you remember the vans coming down by the flagpoles and they could go up from the flagpoles. And so I started going to the town uh, asking uh, you know, for curb cuts and can we do this or can we do that and uh, the mayor at the time, Jack Thompson said, you know, you'd get a lot more done if you ran for office, you're on this side of the table he says, you ought to give it some thought and in 1977 I did 
Was it difficult to balance your career here as a professor with uh, your role? As no, it was. Uh, I don't know if there's ever a better combination than what I had. Uh, uh, you know, I was a sociologist. Uh, you know, sociologists is communities, so it was a natural for me. Uh, the college presidents were wonderful. The uh, division directors were wonderful, and that they knew I had obviously obligations. When I was elected, I was elected deputy mayor, so I was chairing a lot of subcommittees right in the very beginning, from '77 on. I was there for 28 years, and I'll say in 28 years I was teaching here. But uh, we had enough interest in sociology, which was great because there were enough courses, so that I would usually get uh, two Tuesday, Thursdays into the morning, and maybe a night course, and. Uh, on a Monday, Wednesday, because I know I always had Tuesday night meetings, but I was able to move my schedule, and, and it was important to the college uh, to have a faculty member who was the deputy mayor at the time, and then uh, eventually, uh, uh, ironically, at one time, uh, my deputy mayor was Mary Ann Hanley from our own division, and Eleanor Coltman was on the board, and so on, as, as many of us started to run for office and, again, give back to the community. Is there any particular accomplishment that you could look back at them and say, gee, I'm really proud I did that, or I'm really proud I was involved with that? I think the strongest thing I did was probably developing the voluntary action program, the internship programs, because that just piggybacked and allowed others to have real learning opportunities besides the classroom. I mean, we had a lot of students could do all well in the classroom, but getting out and getting that experience, when you go out and apply for a job and you say, well, I've already spent the you know, a year or a half a year in two different placements, and this is what I've done there, and these are the responsibilities I've had. And you're answering questions like you know what you're talking about because you've been there. I don't think we could ever do anything more for our students to provide that opportunity. And so if there's any one program that stands out in my mind, that would be it. Let me mention a couple of names and uh, give me a few recollections about individuals. And we'll start with uh, Eleanor Coltman. Eleanor Coltman. When I first uh, was on the faculty, uh, that was the day we had the trailers in back of the Hartford Road campus. Eleanor Coltman, Louis Montes, Dave Gidman, myself, were all in this little one-person trailer. You had to step over the desk to get to your desk and so on. But Eleanor was one of those that kind of took me under her wing. Uh, she's the one that you know, did, asked me to uh, think about going on the Human Relations Commission and so on. Uh, uh, you know, she was very strong, very pro-Manchester, very pro-student, and uh, really was kind of, uh, you know, I used to call her grammar all the time. She was uh, uh, the, probably had the most influence on me as a new faculty member among anybody. Mary Ann Henley? Mary Ann, uh, you know, very much like Eleanor, uh, good, strong, liberal Democrat, uh, always cared about, again, community, really... Uh, really worked to get the word out with the internship programs and so on. Uh, we ran together several times for office. Uh, we just fed off of each other, uh, worked well together. Uh, and, and again, we were both in the social sciences, so our offices were close by. Uh, you could sit there and you could always you know, stop at the door and say, you know, did you see the paper yesterday? Or did you hear what so-and-so did or so on? And we always had that rapport that, uh, that you probably just don't have today. Yeah. Uh, John Sutherland. So they had a, another, again, the local bond. He started to do the historical tours. Uh, we, had, uh, we had these dilapidated buildings, the old Cheney buildings, and uh, uh, this was one of Steve Penny's, I think, highlights of Steve's career as, uh, as the mayor. Uh, he went after funds and uh, began a program to try and renovate those buildings. We, now we can see the great housing uh, opportunities. Many of our students lived there uh, and so on. Uh, uh, that, I think, was extremely significant. And Souther was the one that focused on the historical perspective. We had that whole region designated as a historical area as opposed to historical buildings. One of the first times that designation was given, in fact, pretty much the entire neighborhood all the way over to Keeney Street. And without John Sutherland and John's help, uh, again, not even living in Manchester but caring about the community, uh, that was a big, big help, a big step for us in getting that designation. Fred Well? Oh, he was just a master. Uh, he was just such a gentle person. Uh, he had ideas. Of, I, he must have woken up at 3 o'clock every day just wondering, how am I going to do this and how am I going to do that? He cared about faculty. When somebody says open door, I mean, Fred Lowe had an open door. I mean, I was a student, and I could get out. He could just knock on the door, come in, sit down. And uh, he would never hesitate to say, well, you know, what if we did this? Uh, I remember, uh, God, he wanted to start the Brazilian Studies program. 
which in fact we implemented. We had three students, I think, were in the program the first year. He wasn't going to let that go because he figured Brazil was one of the, you know, this is the future. And uh, in fact, Diane McCutcheon, who was with us still today, uh, our most senior faculty member, a member of the staff, uh, came through that Brazilian studies program back in the early 1970s. So, uh, Bob Vader. Vader was, uh, you know, he was one of those you loved him, you hated him. Uh, you hated him because he was. He was so excitable, and you hated him, along with Sid, because uh, you know they were strong pro-union organizers, uh, very liberal. We had a lot of you know remember we had the math sciences and everything else developing, and the, and the business careers division, and so we were at polar opposites as far as philosophy. Well, nobody could be more more to the left than Bob and Sid, and uh, today we can all say thank God they were here. Because uh, they organized the union, uh, they made the union strong. Uh, you know, many of us are today retired, and uh, uh, without their efforts, uh, we wouldn't have the benefits that we have today. Uh, they were clearly the two that made that happen. But more important, remember, we went through a series of presidents here for a period of time, and there were times when, uh, if we were not protected, to do what we felt was right in our classroom in teaching and so on. Some of us would have lost jobs, uh, particularly under one president who was here for a year. Uh, it was just, uh, it, was a, it, it was a strong anti-union, anti-faculty process at that time. Uh, and that's when you realized how important it was to have that membership and that, that protection. I never realized how important it was until then. Maybe a few more words about Sid. Yeah, Sid was uh, you know, just, uh, again, the organizer, uh, you know, tremendous historian. Uh, he had so much up in his head you know, that uh, you know, he could talk about anything. He was just one of those guys that knew not just a little, but a lot about everything. And so uh, whatever you're talking about, Sid was, was able to do that with his excitable way. I mean, you get going, you have to slow down. Slow down, Sid, slow down, Sid. Uh, you know, he just was a master. And again, out of the social sciences and so uh, we spent more time in the coffee rooms, uh, and every one of these, mostly these, you know, people from other buildings and other faculty buildings would come over, and uh, faculty East was kind of the hangout at the time, and the coffee rooms are hangout. Uh, Tom Connors was another one that had a great, and Tom came up from New York Police Department, retired, and helped develop the law enforcement program with Freiheit, and uh, uh, another master at conversation and thinking and doing things differently, and uh, uh, she's very just, just great discussions. Great, we would issue each other challenges. We would provoke each other. We just had fun being there. If you were talking to someone who has just been hired to start their teaching career at MCC this fall, mm -hmm. what advice would you give to that person? First of all, to get the best job in the world. I, I never ever felt I had a job. I loved going to work, and. It, they're going to find that same thing. You can go to UConn and go to those classes of 700 people where there's a grad or two grad or three grad assistants teaching. We don't have any of that. You have an ability to build a rapport with students that are taking your course. That's the important thing. They're taking the course that you teach. You control that course. You can share as much as you want. And if you put any, anything into teaching, you put yourself into teaching. Teaching is not just reciting to me. It's 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 being involved with the students, and you have a chance to build a rapport with 200 students a semester that you'll have nowhere else. Uh, they're here because they want to be here. Uh, they're, they're here to learn, and you just uh, you know take advantage of it. Uh, don't be afraid to do things differently. Uh, make sure you stay in charge of your classroom, obviously. Uh, and if you do that and you do it right, they're going to come back and they're going to tell others, and uh, and you'll you'll enjoy it. Uh, the first semester is tough. First semester, you know, it's not easy to stand in front of a group of people. I was intimidated by that in the beginning, uh, but you get through it. In fact, one of my students probably was more helpful. I had a student tell me one day, he says, "You know, you you you're relying too much on your textbook, and you you're too stiff. You got to loosen up. Walk around. Uh, you know, enjoy yourself in the classroom." And uh, he was an older student, uh, older, probably thirty, <laughs> but. Uh, uh, you know, it was a message I never forgot, and I, I vowed I would do it differently, and uh, and I did. And uh, you know, he changed the way I was doing it. I was just I was stiff, 
yeah, you, you'll you reach that point where you'll learn and you you relax. Uh, you know, it's very difficult. If, you know, you got to start somewhere. Your first couple of weeks in a classroom are hard. Is there anything you would change about the time you spent here? No, I I couldn't think of anything I would change. Uh, uh, it just uh, I might not have. If, if I could, I wouldn't have worked two full time jobs. Uh, I mean, in between that, I mean, I, I mean, I was just. I guess I was young enough, so it was okay. I, you know, I seemed tired a lot, but you know, I used to be doing homework, running the machine at Pratt Whitney at three in the morning. So I mean, it was a, you know, it was a crazy, crazy situation. But it was, uh, uh, I wouldn't change anything. So. Anything else you want to talk about or discuss? No, but I'll go back to something I said earlier. This idea of the four-year college, and we got a good, great university, the University of Connecticut. We've got great state colleges. We need community colleges. I don't know if we need 11 of them or 9 of them, but we need good, strong, regional community colleges. It would be just a terrible, terrible mistake to change what we have here. Good. I think we're done. That was very good. Very eloquent. Thank Your you. Your passion really comes forward. Good. Thank you. I love it. You know.